And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. We we are at we are at the penultimate chapter of the of our class overview part of our overview of Heavens and Heresies. Indeed. And this time this, and this time around we are going to be tackling the vessel, which last week I said that the vessel was akin to the warlock. I was only half right. The vessel is akin is basically basically him taking the cleric and the warlock and kit bashing them together. And then making it better than than fifth edition's base cleric or warlock, and also still keeping them both synergistic and unable to act alone, or well, able to act alone, but you know, that's never any fun. Better to act with others. Right. Mm hmm. <sighs> so, but before we before we even get into that, the first thing that we the fr there is one thing that you brought up last week that I wanted to I wanted you to go into a bit of detail on, but we didn't have time. Indeed, so, we have talked about in the past how Third Edition had a problem of Godzilla, also known as D and D on Easy Mode, also also like known as the also also known as. Matt Mercer's preferred way to play characters. <laughs> <laughs> Cleric or Druidzilla, which, mm -hmm. as we've seen with the drill, the the Druid here in Heavens and Heresies, uh, it it can't do. And even in base base fifth, uh, Druid was no longer the singular powerhouse that it was in third. Mm -hmm. No, instead no. you had argued Cowzilla or Cleric or Warlock. Yes. Fifth Ed, in in my opinion, its Zilla is still cleric or warlock. Still cleric because clerics different paths that they can take, their archetypes, their subclasses, whatever you want to call them. Um all in one way or another can make the the adventure pretty much easy mode for a cleric. Um mm -hmm. especially things like the War Cleric, or the Tempest Cleric. Um, especially since your channeled divinity can still be used to turn undead no matter which domain you take, or rebuke undead, and can, I, I believe you, it could even be used for some healing no matter which domain you could take. Um, so, you, you had all the little utilities of just general cleric, Along with things like, I can wear heavy armor and hit you real, real good with War Cleric and Tempest mm -hmm. Cleric. And don't get me started on how Tempest Cleric can use all the, the magic of storm element type stuff to fuck your day over. Mm -hmm. But that's just one half of the equation. Now we get to the Warlock. The Warlock is by and far the single most customizable class of the base classes in 5th ed. You've got all the Eldritch invocations to add all the fun little pieces and bits here and there. You've got the different pacts you can take that give you vastly different play styles and access to spells the normal Warlock list does not have, because each pact grants you some additional spells from that pact type. But one of the most common things I saw when watching Warlocks play... Pack to the Fiend, because killing things gives you a temp HP shield, which means n not only are you not squishy, because I believe Warlocks were D8 health, um, mm -hmm. but also you you uh, then killed something, got temp HP, and could keep killing things to keep refreshing the temp HP. Um, as we all know, temp HP doesn't stack unless it explicitly says it stacks. If, if you get a new amount of temp HP that is higher than your old amount of temp HP, your new temp HP is that a new amount. At least that's how it usually worked in most cases. Um, and then, of course, things like Pact of the Blade, uh, the, the or the the um, the the feature 
the pact of the blade that gives you that that pact blade that you can always summon to you. Yeah, hex the for those who want to do hex blade builds. Yeah, and uh, and then of course there was the spell snipe cantrip of eldritch blast, which. Yes, it's five separate blasts when you're high enough level, and you have to roll for each blast. But you can also increase its range. You can make it, uh, you can make it do all sorts of fun little things, to the point where you could be a frontline fighter, and at the same time, rear guard, or you know, ranged fighter, if you just wanted to, didn't want to be up front today. Mm -hmm. Warlock was easily so abusable that you could. With uh, Devil's Eyes, see through all darkness, including magical darkness. And then you cast darkness on a pebble like everybody does. Throw it out there and take advantage of that. War Warlock and Cleric both have 5e on easy mode. And it's because of the vast amount of options they have that can stack to make them the center of gameplay. So that's why I think they're Cowzilla. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I remember you said you wanted to see where we overlap on all of this. Yeah, and I'm I can't I can't I can't disagree on the, on that front, especially since um what I do what I what I will always find funny about fifth edition's design is some and this is something we kind of touched on last night when we were when we were um when we when we were get when we were giving the essentials classes the old heave ho mm -hmm. is the is the fact that. 5e likes to tout, likes to tout up and down and all around about how much simpler it is about it about its simplicity its ease of access all all of that fun stuff and, and the point i'm oh sorry go ahead <laughs> and yet you have this vast amount of variance with these two classes i did say last night and we and we continue to say this in the monastery simplicity is not bad if you pull off simplicity well, and the system works well with that simplicity, and everybody's having fun, you've done it right. But, in this case, we all know 5e has simplified many different things from other uh, editions of D&D. And then you add Cleric and Warlock to the mix, who have a vast myriad amount of complexity and if you have something that has a lot of complexity in a game where simplicity is the alleged focus, it can go one of two ways. The things that are complex are gimped because the complexity is required for them to work. And since they have to work in a framework of simplicity, uh, they, get stu they get stumped. They get uh, you know stunted. Their growth is denied. Or due to the vast amount of choices they have in, in all of their complexity, they trounce the system. Which is the case here. Mm -hmm. And the re the big reason that, the big reason that I that I pick up that I pick on the class design with these two in particular be, out of this is more is more of hypocrisy. If you want to if you want to have classes ha having a whole lot of variance I don't care for this idea of having some classes be dirt simple and some classes be ex be extremely complicated. Now, there were there were degrees of simplicity and complexity with class design in say 13th age. Mm -hmm. But even so, even something as sim even something as straightforward as the barbarian wasn't it wasn't a one trick pony. That's true. I uh, <laughs> the 13th age barbarian's simplicity is almost a, a facade it's almost a, a yes is the barbarian as simple as it looks sure does that mean the barbarian plays as simple as it looks no <laughs> it it has a lot of different little things looking here and there that change and can change drastically how your barbarian is going to react in a given situation I have com I have compared the talent system that Thirteenth Age had, and this is key for the Barbarian because it gets more talents than other than other archetypes, not by mm -hmm. much. But I've but I've compared it to the the way perks initially worked when they were prop when they were properly introduced and and some argue perfected 
in Modern Warfare 2. Now, I know I know it's verboten for me to bring up Call of Duty in a in a sub in a subject about nerds, but here's but here's the here's my logic. Your choice in Modern Warfare 2 and to a certain degree Modern Warfare 3 and to as well as um as basically the good um, Call of Duty's before things fill up before the things fill off the rails after black after Black Ops two. Mm-hmm. Your choice of perks was a very clear indicator of what sort of weapon you'd probably be using and what sort of playstyle you'd probably be using. Yep. Your your perks defined uh your basic tactics and strategy within the battle. Mm-hmm. If somebody if somebody picked scavenger, odds are pretty good they're going to be going in with a light machine gun. Mm-hmm. You know because those things eat, those things chew through chew through ammo like like me chewing through lunch. So, and now I just have have a a a, a, uh, a picture of a monk themed Gatling gun. <laughs> Yeah, it fi- it fires individual prayer beads, and each prayer bead says "fuck off." <laughs> that is that is a ter that that is a t- that is a terrible idea, and I pr- and I will prob I will probably one day commission somebody to somebody to make a um to make it not just a monk Gatling gun, but um a mo- but a monk version of Heavy Arms Kai. Cool. <laughs> that, uh... Is I, that not... I, do, I don't want a gunpla of that. You can kitbash your own gunpla <laughs> of that. I'm not, do, I'm not doing that. I don't, ha- I don't have the setup to... My, my workshop isn't, fi- isn't finished, so I wouldn't, so I wouldn't be doing any gunplas. Because <laughs> if I, if I, if I end up starting the journey into, into, into that particular variety of plastic crack, um... I want to. I want to make sure everybody can watch me fail at it. Well, you know what? That's okay. Um, the one quote that I like from Adventure Time is, "To get good at something, first you gotta suck at something." Mm-hmm. Um, and no, this is not an endorsement of Adventure Time. Just that one quote. The rest of you, shut the fuck up. I can hear you ringing in the backgrounds. Oh, <sighs> oh, believe me, we'll have. Um, I can guarantee sometime in 2022 we'll, we'll have some words about um, the about Bean Mouth. The CalArts? Mm-hmm. Somebody told me Butch Hart, uh, uh, Butch, <laughs> Butch's style was CalArts. I'm like, this is nothing like Banana Mouth. What the fuck are you on? I don't like I don't like Butch Hartman these days, but I but I'd rather put him to an open flame over his actual mistakes rather than rather than um mista- rather than mistakes in someone's head. They're like it's generic CalArt style. I'm like, no, he's had this style since the '90s. Mm-hmm. This is very clearly him. But yeah, rails. Getting, getting back on, getting back on the rails. Um. Now the as we mentioned now as we mentioned before the vessel is the is an attempt to combine the cl- the cleric and the war- and the warlock, which he felt were similar. And I did ask I I messaged him. Yesterday, and I asked him a couple things. One, his take on the vanilla cleric and warlock, his issue, his issues with both, why he combined the two, and what the vessel brings to the table. And here's what he had to say on the matter. So I have a whole host of problems with both classes mechanically. They aren't the main issues I have with the classes, but they're still worth mentioning. The cleric is pretty ridiculous with what it gets access to, the abilities it has, what it can wear, all of that. And for me, the warlock, again, not counting the multi-class silliness that people often use it for, most of the time ends up being a steaming pile of garbage at the table, and to re-emphasize, I don't actually believe that's 5e's fault. 5e is a lot more a, a lot more of a balanced game when GMs run 6 encounters per day and allow for 3 short rests in that day. But nobody does that. Most GMs run three encounters per day with one short rest, and that borks the warlock because it means the other casters can nova pretty much every fight and the and the encounters start feeling super wonky. But the main issues I have with both warlock and cleric have to do with class fantasy and GM responsibility, because they are both classes that have to do with serving a patron, be they divine or otherwise, 
thematically and yet have no mechanics for interacting with a patron. So, in order to have what should be the core component of your character's class, it's the GM who has to create all of that. And what that leads to, a lot of the time, is either the GM doing nothing, because they have a lot to do already, putting in a whole lot of extra work, or using it as an excuse to take away class core mechanics and call it roleplay. I.e., your patron is mad at you, so you don't get your class features until you fix it slash figure out why. Oh yeah, paladins know that feel. <laughs> So for the redesign, I wanted the core mechanics for the vessel to emphasize interaction with their patron, but not in a way that would lead it to that last case, you don't get your core features, because that's lame. So what I ended up doing is making a carrot-type system rather than a stick-type system. Vessels get to set up goals, and this is the same terminology used for the group setting up goals in order to gain XP, which grant them resources when they fulfill them. The difficulty of the goals generates set amounts of resources which have intuitive limitations and guidelines already placed on them. So this means, for me, that the fantasy starts to make more sense. The vessel, who is constantly serving their patron, constantly reaching the goals they set, is going to have more resources, and these are one-time use things. That one does that one who doesn't than one who doesn't, but each of them will still get access to the awesome class features of the vessel. Which, which is fantastic. Which does does now that whole that whole paladin jab that was that was not him that was me obviously but it does kind of high but I bring that up because we've talked about the paladin having a bit of a bit of a reputation as a problem class because they have a G, because they have a GM enforced re, a GM and, and rules enforced reason to act like a dick. A person who's just playing a chaotic neutral rogue acts like a dick because they think it's funny. Or because they're edgy and think that chaotic neutral means they ha they have license to act like a psychotic. Mm -hmm. But the the but with with paladins you have you we've talked about the whole fall or die thing. We have talked about how paladins ha how paladins um have to have to deal with have to deal with the whole it the whole would you kill baby orc thing although fortunately got although if it was a goblin that you you'd already know the answer to that question or rather goblin slayer would know it the only good goblin is a dead goblin um <laughs> it's not far off from what he actually says that is what he actually says that is one of the lines from the book <laughs> When when a priestess tries to ask if there's a, if he's ever encountered a good goblin, um, I remember the manga translated as the only the only good ones are the ones that don't crawl out of their stinking holes. <laughs> it's a little bit of artistic flair, yeah. But when it comes. But when it comes to when it comes when it comes to when it comes to this this particular um setup, you have you there is the you because of the fact that that's hanging over a lot of paladins' heads, they end up feeling like they have to overcompensate, which is why you have lawful stupid moments. And the same can the same can be said for clerics and vessels. And as I mentioned on t both last night and on Twitter, I, I, ask, I sometimes have to ask the question: Why is it that clerics? Why is it that a cleric, no matter what their no matter what their deity, has to have turn undead and has to have um, cure, has to have cure wounds or, in the case of paladins, lay on hands? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Especially, especially, especially since, for the longest time, we've had it that that um, clerics can clerics will um, gain different spells based on their based on their patron deity's domains, or in some cases, just their patron deity. Period. So, so again, why do, why have it that they have to that they have those specific things? Well, except except in the edition that everyone hates, but us. <laughs> On the edition I never got to play. Yeah. Um, 
But that's because those were designed by people who were competent, i.e. Heinzo, not Merle's. Ah, <laughs> uh, pedals kept harping on Merle's too. I um, I've ar- I've I've already I've already made clear my th- my thoughts on Mike Merle's. He's he's the he he's been the third wheel for most of the time I've I've known about him, and his work show his, his work shows on that front. Mm-hmm. Which is why it's funny hearing him talk about some of the ideas that they had for fourth edition. I'm like, bitch, you didn't have those ideas. Heinso did. Oh, the only the only good thing you the only thing good thing you ever did was show up at Gen Con in a in a fake fro. A fake fro. Well. But with that said, this is as good a time as any to cover the vessel proper, and this means that you, this means that you unfortunately once again, Zan, have to cos as to have to vocally cosplay as a knife ear. Yep, he uh, he doesn't like me cosplaying as knife ears, even though the knife ears in this game are not as bad as the knife ears elsewhere. I am a vessel of Charon, wearer of souls, keeper of histories, bringer of endless slumber. The aspects of my god are varied. Some embody his propensity for death, while others channel his affinity for life and history. I myself resonate with the peace and comfort he can bring. The endless slumber is, if nothing else, peaceful. A calm infinity, orchestrated by the record-keeper of the abyss, lord of jewels and precious things. I am but a channel of his will, a walking embodiment of our lord of the eternal. I am a harbinger of peace, a soothing calm amidst the chaos of the world. Come, weary traveler, walk with me, and I will show you an endless peace from which you shall never Wake. The Senia Dusk Dreamer, Elven Vessel of Caron. Just make sure not to mispronounce it and call and call it a Karen. Yeah, that was forced. Moving on. So the vessel has has resolve as its primary um core, core ability. Vessels it, are do or die. Wow, um, nice. A vessel is connected to their patron through willpower and determination. Resolve is the ab- is the ability score used for a skill or spell attack you make as a vessel. Why oh. is that final boss music I hear in the background? <laughs> determination, anybody? <laughs> we don't. We don't. We're not going to be touching that for a f- for a couple of weeks, man. <laughs> bum 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 bum. <laughs> da 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 da. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> yes, you will. So, uh, when it comes to proficiencies, you are proficient in light armor, medium armor, light shields, and standard shields. You have simple proficiency with four weapon subtypes of your choice. You are proficient in your resolve and intuition defenses. You learn think- one language of your choice. And hang. I'm going. Hang on. I'm going to grab. I'm going to. I'm going to grab the f- the fi- the fighter just so just so I can make just so I can know make sure. Yeah. Um. Even even though you have a good amount of weapon proficiencies, you still don't have as many as the fighter. The fighter has all weapon proficiencies at martial. Hmm. Uh, let's see. And as a vessel, you have a number of base vitality points equal to half your level rounded up. Then we get to the raising the death flag. When the vessel raises the death flag, they are instantly restored to full HP, may invoke their patron as a free action once per turn without expending resources, and may choose two additional secondary options for spells they cast. These additional secondary options do not count against the total maximum they may channel into any one spell. I think the most important bad is important, important part of that is going to be the... Uh invoke their pact at will 
once per one once per uh turn mm-hmm. for for those of you who, who wonder why i said at will instead of as a free action um it's because they're the same thing it's just one is one it's it's different phraseology for different turn types but a free action is exactly what it sounds like an action that costs nothing and does not use any of the, the pieces of your action economy mm-hmm Now, as for starting gear, you start with one adventuring kit, one weapon and shield, or two weapons, and tier one light or medium armor. They're and... another class that's defined by the by the pact they make, obviously. Yep. Thus, they get their uh, they get their their pact of uh, power at level one. Mm-hmm. Essentially, they already start with their subclass, and we have the daily RP allo- allotment. Um, I'm pretty sure we'll be getting to that shortly. So, let's start at first level. First thing you get is Pact of Power. A vessel's powers are derived from their relationship to a powerful being. This being could be a deity, demon, or other powerful entity. The choice is yours. But the choice must fit the setting of the GM's adventure and is subject to the GM's approval. Whatever your choice and patron, you share a relationship with them. Like other relationships in Heavens and Heresies, the strength of this relationship is represented numerically in relationship points. These RP may be spent in order to call upon your patron to intervene on your behalf. Requesting the aid of your patron requires you to spend your action and an amount of RP matching the impact the request will have on the adventure. Impact is a term further explained in the GM's toolkit. Some requests have a fixed cost. You may request your patron grant you the effect of any ritual artistry without needing proficiency or the necessary materials as long as you spend the appropriate amount of RP located in the Vessel Relationship point table. You may make requests of your patron that do not involve rituals. In these cases, the GM determines the impact, and thus RP cost, of your request. If you do not have enough RP to fulfill your request, you do not lose RP merely for asking. Sometimes a request might seem inconsequential to you, but would have considerable impact on the events of the adventure. Because the GM is the only person capable of knowing the full impact of a request, only they may determine the point cost of any given request. Some requests are beyond the scope of what your patron is able to grant you. While it might be common for vessels to request things like immortality, permanent ability increases, godlike power, or world destruction, such things... Things such as these are beyond the scope of what patrons are able to grant. The pact you share with your patron exists to temporarily aid you in the encounters you might face rather than instantly fix them. Your vessel class table shows your daily RP allotment. You regain any points spent from this pool whenever you rest. The RP allotted to you as a vessel is relatively low and so, to supplement those points, when you create your character you may set up a goal with your GM to reflect the nature of your relationship with your patron and potentially gain additional RP. Your GM determines the difficulty of this goal, which determines how many RP are granted to you upon its completion. When you complete this goal, you are granted the associated amount of RP and may then choose a new goal. Unlike your daily allotment of RP, RP gained in this way neither refresh nor disappear when you rest. The goal should reflect the type of relationship you share with your patron. A vessel who is completely devoted to their deity might set a goal to construct an altar to their deity in a village or convert an important diplomat. The difficulty of either goal will be dependent on the adventure. While a vessel who has made a deal with a being of the abyss might need to desecrate an altar or village or sacrifice the daughter of an important diplomat to their dark overlord. The type of relationship you share with your patron is up to you, the player, but a list is given below to help organize your thoughts. Um, and we have the relationship point tables. Inconsequential, minor, considerable, major, the the material, ritual, equivalent, common, uncommon, rare, very rare, legendary, and then the point cost, then the goal difficulty, and the point value. Uh, yep. It goes up, and then we have an, then we have a bulky but important dev note. At first, now at first glance, this system might look like it places a lot of pressure on the GM. I assure you it does not. These keywords are already programmed into things the GM will be doing already, even if a vessel is not in the game. For example, encounters, rather than being rated on a CR level system, 
are rated by the common legendary system. The system is also keyed to certain level capstones within the game itself. 1 to 4 is common, 5 to 10 is uncommon, 11 to 16 is rare, 7 to 19 is very rare, and 20 plus is legendary. This system is also keyed into the reward system of the game. Common encounters generate common materials and loot, which can be used for common rituals and items. Uncommon generate uncommon materials and loot, etc. Even better, this reward system is tied into the narrative of the game as well. When you fight a group of wild beasts, or anything, I just randomly thought of bears. <laughs> Sorry, I meant bears, not beasts. As an uncommon encounter, the question of, I want to harvest their bones and pelts, how much is that worth, is already answered. The party would receive uncommon materials in the form of pelts and bones, which would have a specific resonance keyed to the bears, elemental earth most likely. These systems are automated for the, G for the GM, though there are also guidelines for treasure troves and other such rewards. The point here is that this system allows the vessel to interact with their patron on a mechanical and narrative level in a way that is both fluid, but also provides a wealth of examples in the form of ritual artistries. Of what can be expected in terms of power at each tier of RP, so as not to burden GMs with balancing the game for me, because GMs have enough have enough to do. I really like this. Mm -hmm. I do so, hope that this dev note um, sticks, because I think it is very important. The question it, is, which of the characters is going to be the one that says it? I think it's going to be the too serious uh, rogue. What do you think? <laughs> Prob probably. Um, and then the, the not too serious paladin is going to be like, bro, can can you give me the cliff notes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the th one thing that one thing that this really highlights is the is the fact that unlike the, unlike the quote unquote tier system that's in vanilla, which doesn't really matter mechanically. Mm-hmm. It barely meant the only thing it seems to matter is for certain uh, modules, and even that's a stretch. Correct. It's such a stretch. It's doing the Jacko pose. I was gonna say it's such a stretch. It's like ha it's like having Plastic Man drawn and quartered across the. Uh, earth. I don't. I don't think. I don't think that's a. I. I, I think more people are gonna get the Jacko pose joke, Monk. Sorry. Well, that's because that's because we have too many weebs and too many horny bastards. Yeah, but we but we do not we do not try and put anybody in horny jail sim for one simple reason. Why do why do that when they're gonna when they're gonna break out eventually? No, I do it for an even simpler reason, monk. If horny jail is where you put all of the horny people, what's going to happen? Yeah. Things, things I can't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> things I can't talk about, but are probably brought up in a James Brown song. We'll put it that way. <laughs> I feel good. <laughs> Wasn't going with that one specifically, but I'll take it. It works. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it serves its purpose. Um, um, then we, we have three example pacts of power. You are a devoted follower of your patron, and they have gifted you with power in exchange. Your patron may have saved your life or otherwise aided you to earn your devotion, or maybe your devotion has caused you to stand out to your patron. You have given... Second one, you have given something or have promised to give something to your patron in return for your power. For one reason or another, you needed the power offered by your patron and sacrificed something or promised to sacrifice something in order to obtain it. Or thirdly, you provide a service for your patron and in return your patron blesses you with power. You might provide something that your patron would otherwise have difficulty obtaining, or you might fulfill some role that your patron is too busy to fulfill themselves. Now, I, I do want to note to anyone else that's listening, this does not say it is an exhaustive list of examples. So before you begin your what if this happens for that pact, um discuss it with your GM. Uh, one of my favorite packs I came up with for Warlock was a man pushed to his death by a different agent of his of his uh, pact bound um, patron. But as he's dying, the uh, 
the patron forces the pact on him and said, hey, I saved your life, so now you serve me. Mm -hmm. Fun stuff. You know, memes is... Uh, memes aside, there is there is one character, especially especially in one of his more more recent more um I won't say recent but recent ish runs, who I'd I'd say I'd say is one very strong interpretation of a warlock's relationship with their patron. Mm -hmm. I know I've br I know I've brought him up before in in meme form, but Warren Ellis's Warren Ellis's run on Moon Knight. <laughs> yes, there's the whole thing with the memes, but I specifically bring that up because one, he's ref um he is Konshu's avatar, and two, in that particular comic, because Konshu as at the god the god himself has multiple aspects. There are multiple aspects to to uh, Moon Knight, basically, basically reinterpreting the whole multiple personalities that that War that Warren Spector has. Mm -hmm. So you have you have one you have one that embodies the more mystical aspect. You have one that embodies the more co the more common setup, and one and one in a in a suit, simply known as Mister Knight. <laughs> oh. But rega but anyways. So uh, at an, also at first level we g you gain spell casting. And look we we've, we've got we've gone over how spell casting works for and the thing is um, the thing is something that we, something that's been made clear to us as we've been doing this is that spell casting more le spell casting as a whole works exactly the same for every cl for every class. The difference is in the finer detail about about how, about what aspects of spell casting they can use more. Yep. Um, case in point, druids are the king of um of sec of secondary effects. Sorcerers, who we talked about last week, are the king of spell points. Especially yep. at high levels, where where they can get almost all of their spell points back. Yep. Let's see at and at um at fifth, eleventh, and seventeenth level, you can choose one additional secondary option each time you cast a spell without spending spell points. So let's see. At first level, you you know two spells. You have a max of two spell points. You recover two spell points, and you have a secondary effect limit of one. And at twentieth level, you have four spell points. Oh, sorry, four spells known, ten maximum spell points, ten recoverable spell points, and a secondary effect limit of nine. <laughs> So you're you're gonna be you're gonna be rec you may not have you may not be able to throw around as much as some other classes, but you're gonna get that stuff back quick. You're gonna get all of it back, even when, if you just uh, push forward rather than rest. Mm -hmm. So at and we and we have to make one slight correction. At second level, you get your subclass. <laughs> In no, that's case, when you get a feature. Your pact yeah, of powers right. at first. All right, my, my, my bad, my mistake. Um, this is the archetype that then flavors your your pact. Yeah, so at second level, you gain you gain your you gain, um, you you choose one domain related to your patron, at each level where you would gain a dom a domain, where you'd gain a domain of power feature, you'll be presented with multiple options. You may select whichever option best fits the relationship you share, but may not change your choice at later levels. And you do this again at sixth, eighth, and seventeenth. Mm -hmm. You also gain <clears throat> invocation. You may expend a willpower in order to invoke the name of your patron, granting you specific effects based on your domain of power. Willpower expended in this way does not recover normally. 
You may regain one willpower expended in this way when you push forward, and you regain all willpower expended in this way when you rest. Uh, I would pr I would advise doing a bit of an aside, get um giving s giving um. All right. Actually, no. I take I take that back. We'll be getting we'll be calling back to this when we get when we get to the um, archetypes. Yep. So. <sighs> Hang on, hang on a minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, ne so next at fifth level, you gain a bonus spell or martial feat. You either gain a spell casting feat or a martial feat. You may choose an additional feat from one of those categories again at 11th and 17th level. At 6th level, you gain Bestowal of Power. You choose one of the following benefits and you may change your choice during an extended rest. Lower your lowest ability score by 2. Increase your maximum and recoverable spell you, points by 1. Monk, you mean increase your lowest ability score by 2. Yeah, increase your lowest ability score by 2. My, my bad. And, or you can increase your willpower by one. At 10th and 20th levels, you may choose an additional benefit, you may choose a different benefit, or may choose the same benefit multiple times. And then there's a dev note. <laughs> While it looks like the vessel doesn't have a 20th level capstone, their daily relationship points allotment jumps from 6 at 19th level to 8 at 20th meaning they can call their patron to have a considerable impact on the game every single day, which is a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. So, then we get to the archetypes. The first one is Order and Chaos. It's a ladder. <laughs> so, at second level, you, you gain... You gain eight, you Either the Madness or the Enthrall spell for free. It does not count against the number of spells you may know. If you already know both spells, you can instead learn a spell of your choice. And remember, spells aren't only granted to you by uh, your classes. There are feats and uh, racial abilities and such that I'm sure will also figure in from your background and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so while you do only get two spells known according to the spellcasting table for cleric uh, that doesn't mean that you're anywhere near um, <laughs> having an issue where you just chose madness and enthrall because you thought it was neat and then you choose this and well now you get to choose one other mm -hmm. you could have multi you could get madness and enthrall from f for free from other f features for all you know so, when it comes to the invocation options, you can either choose Pandemonium or Nullification. The former, as an action, you present you present your spellcasting focus. Creatures of your choice within 30 feet of you become confused. The severity of the condition is equal to your resolve modifier. Or Nullification. As an action, you present your spellcasting focus. Creatures of your choice within 30 feet of you become stunned. The severity of the condition is equal to your resolve, and let's not forget, resolve is the thing you're going to be using for all your att all your attacks and castings. So it's probably going to be pretty damn high. This is resolve mod. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing it right, your resolve mod should already be probably at least a plus two at le at level at level two. Mm -hmm. Let's see, at third level, you choose you choose between one of two features as uh, once again. Either Chaotic Whispers, you can communicate telepathically with any creature you can see within 30 feet of you. You do not need to share a language with the creature for it to understand your telepathic utterances, but the creature must be able to understand at least one language. I could see some people really fucking with people with this. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Especially since it's a one-way te one telepathy, so I could... So, imagine a invo Imagine a vessel... Um... Play, playing poker and just and just to fuck with everybody else um, gives them bad information about ev about everyone else's hand. Well, I mean, there's also there's also the fact that this actually can do the moonlight the moonlight meme. 
Dracula, where's my fucking money? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, but ju but just f just find interesting ways to f to screw over their concentration without do without doing anything. So they so as far as they know, they may have they may as well have just been hearing voices. Yeah, they they made a mistake and that was it. Mm -hmm. Or you get level-headed. You're immune to the effects of compel and confuse unless the severity of those conditions is equal to or greater than your resolve modifier. At se at seventh level, you can choose between disorder or order. Whenever in disorder's case, whenever you have an ally within thirty feet of you who would automatically miss a target, you may confuse one that target. And, whenever you or an ally. Mm -hmm. So if you if you're gonna miss. With the auto miss of one through four on the on the d twenty, you can inflict one severity of confuse, which is fucking broke. <laughs> or order, whenever you or an ally within thirty feet of you would recover, they may purge additional conditions equal to your resolve modifier. Which is also even better. At fourteenth level, you gain unreadable. Your thoughts can't be read by telepathy or other means unless you allow it. You have resistance to psychic damage. If you already have resistance to psychic damage or gain resistance later, you gain immunity instead. And at 18th level, you choose between Cry Havoc, when the Confused Condition activates on a creature within 30 feet of you, and it has 3 or more severity of the condition, you may have it reduce the severity of the condition to 2, rather than purging all of the condition. Nice. Or embodiment of the law. Whenever a creature within 30 feet of you makes an attack roll, you may have that creature take physical damage equal to your resolve modifier, no reaction required. If taking damage would kill the creature, the effects of its attack still occur. This is, um... This, this is required, Monk, I'm sorry. I am the law! Yeah, saw that coming. Well, it even says it in the, uh, in, in the flavor text. Once again, Didn't saw know. that coming. And anyway, <laughs> next is life and death. Also very edgy or not very edgy at all. <laughs> you know but, what we call things that aren't edgy, Tanner, right? We call them edgeless. So at second level, you gain either, as a bonus spell, you gain either Wither or Rejuvenation. And once again, they do these do not count against the number of spells you may know. If you already know both spells, you can instead learn a spell of your choice. At, you, you also gain one of two invocations. Either Touch of Death, when you hit a creature with an attack, you may activate your invocation and afflict physical it. The severity of the condition is equal to your resolve modifier or your proficiency modifier, whichever is higher. Or breath of life. As an action, you present your spellcasting focus. Creatures of your choice within 30 feet of you gain hit points equal to your level plus your resolve modifier. AoE healing? Hell yeah. 30 feet of AoE healing. And it's all creatures of your choice. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're in the fucking thick of it, and you're like, creatures of my choice, all my allies. Oh. And me. Oh. Actually, that's that's a clarification. It says creatures of your choice. Does that mean you can include yourself? Because y you should be able to include yourself. Either that or you shouldn't. Yeah. It's... I can... We can go either way, but, um... Clarification. Here's our first clarification for this class. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, at se at um, third level, you gain knowledge of life and death, i.e., you gain proficiency in the nature and history skills. Um, you should there should probably be there should probably be clarification of what this would do if you already have either the, if you already have either or both of them proficient. Um. I mean, we can make an assumption from seeing other classes of if you already have proficiency, you gain a, a tier of expertise. But yes, the clarification of do you or do you not get a, a, a tier of expertise if you already have these? Yeah, because 
If you don't, you're... well, that's going to feel like a waste. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that it's it's set it on every other one that gives you proficiency in something, and then if, if you already have proficiency in said thing, you get a tier of expertise. Mm -hmm. That sort of consistency should be kept. Yes. So at 7th level, you choose between either Sickening Necrosis, whenever you afflict physical a creature, you may also weaken it. The severity of the weakened condition is equal to your resolve modifier, and the condition is purged once the creature is no longer afflicted physical. So, literally rubbing salt in the wound. <laughs> um, or potent vigor. When a creature within 30 feet of you gains temporary hit points, you may also gain temporary hit points equal to half of the amount rounded up as that creature. That is going oh. to be a very good combo with barbarians. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> because barbarians love their THP. <laughs> Which, which means, with something like this, you love that THP, too. Uh -huh. Let's see. At 14th level, you gain Resist Ailment. You cannot be afflicted, physical, or weakened unless the severity of the condition would surpass your Resolve modifier. Which means, which means at higher levels, the at the le at 14th level, I'd say, I'd say, um, most trash mobs that would do, that would afflict are going to need to be beefy-ass trash mobs. Mm-hmm. At 18th level, you gain either Arbiter of Decay, or creatures of your choice within 30 feet of you are considered to be weakened. The severity of the condition is equal to your Resolve modifier. Or Arbiter of Life. Whenever you or a creature within 30 feet of you gains temporary hit points, you may increase the amount of temporary hit points they gain by an amount equal to half your level plus your resolve modifier. Whenever you or a creature within 30 feet of you gains hit points, you may increase the amount of hit points they gain by your resolve modifier. So essentially, uh, when you do your little holy symbol thing to heal everybody, they get resolve mod more HP. And then when you do your thing where you gain THP as the Barbarian gains THP, uh, you both get lots more THP, or do you have to choose one? Because it says whenever you or a creature within 30 feet of you gains temporary hit points, you may increase the amount of temporary hit points gained. Now, obviously, if the Barbarian's gaining THP, you can do that. But you also have that ability from earlier, if you choose Potent Vigor, if... Does Potent Vigor, does Arbiter of Life trigger off of Potent Vigor? I need to know this. I absolutely need to know this. Because Potent Vigor triggers off of something else getting temporary HP. And this is if you or someone else gains temporary HP. So is this a trigger chain? More, more clarification, please, Tanner. I must know. Now, the next one is Light and Shadow, as far as our Vessel Archetypes. This little light of mine, please don't sing it. I'm gonna let it shine. <laughs> I didn't sing it. Yeah, I walked into that one. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's my sideshow Bob moment. <laughs> anyway, you gain either the light and dark or the fire spell. It does not count against the number of spells you may know. If you already know both spells, you may instead learn a spell of your choice. Oh. You know, I, I would do the crazy world of Arthur Brown joke, but let's be honest, if there's anybody who's going to be doing that joke... It's the it's the sorcerer. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Let's see. So when it comes to the invocations, you have either searing light. As an action, you present your spellcasting focus. Each creature of your choice within thirty feet becomes afflicted fire. The severity of the condition is equal to your resolve modifier. This feature leaves residual light in the area, dispelling a severity of the hidden condition around it equal to your resolve modifier plus your proficiency modifier. In addition, any magical darkness created by an effect equal to or below your level or, or tier within 30 feet of you is dispelled. Very nice. 
uh, or plague of plague of shadows. As an action, you may create a you may create up to four ten foot ra ten foot radius um, spheres of magical darkness anywhere within sixty feet of you that you can see. While within a sphere, you may choose whether or not a creature is hidden from other creatures, or if it is hidden five from other creatures, or if it is blinded five by the sphere. At the beginning of each of your subsequent turns, or every ten seconds if initiative is not being tracked, one of your spheres disappears and you may move your remaining spheres anywhere within sixty feet of you that you can see. You get this at second level? Hidden yep. five, blinded five at level two? <laughs> Holy fuck! Mm -hmm. Hold on, hold on. <clears throat> what the fuck? <laughs> there we go. So at third level, you choose between either concealing shadows, while you remain hidden in darkness, you may increase the severity of the hidden condition by an amount equal to your resolve, or dark sight. You may ignore the severity of the hidden condition caused by darkness equal to your resolve modifier. This feature stacks with other features like dark vision. So in other words, oh, you think darkness is your ally? I was born in it, molded by it. I didn't see the light until I was already a man. And by then, it was nothing to me but blinding. Yes, that is the worst Bane impression you'll ever hear. Not only is it the worst Bane impression I'll ever hear, it's the worst Tom Hardy impression I'll ever hear. Oh. <laughs> Look, just because I'm tall doesn't mean I can pull that off. <laughs> but at 7th level, you gain either Blinding Radiance. Whenever you afflict fire a creature, you may also blind to it. The blind condition is purged when the creature is no longer afflicted fire um or shadow step once per turn when you are hidden by darkness you may teleport to another area within 60 feet of you that is also hidden by darkness as a quick action so those darkness bubbles that you make you can just hop around between them <laughs> so can your uh, disciple of shadows yep you can essentially play three card monty with you and your disciple <laughs> I'm going to play Humanoid 3-card Monty. Let's do it. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Um, it also it also means that if it, if anybody, but especially although with although with that in mind, um, when you when you choose when you choose to either have blind or hit or hidden um, with the, with the with those darkness bubbles as I'm going to call them. Mm -hmm. Um, can you switch bet can you switch between the two, or, you or do you have to stick with one? I think that should be clarified. Because if you can, yeah. if you can switch between the two, that opens a whole host of other options. So, uh, no, even better, can they be chosen individually, sphere by sphere? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so if you if. You if you can switch them, if you can switch them on your next turn when you lose a bubble and move them, and if each bubble can be <laughs> chosen, chosen whether it's hiding or blinding sphere by sphere, those are those are clarifications we need. And if it's yes to both of those, you might want to consider making Searing Light a little stronger somehow to make it more cho more uh, more uh, appealing as a choice <laughs> if you're playing. Because if you choose light and shadow, and you see, and you see plague of shadows, and it does do both of those, that you can choose sphere individually for each sphere, whether it's hidden or blinded, and when you move the spheres each turn, you can switch it if necessary. Um, almost no one is going to choose light, <laughs> especially when you get that at level two. Yeah, some considerations there, Tanner. Just a, just a few things. Mm-hmm. So, at 14th level, you gain Crippling Blindness. Whenever you blind a creature, you may also hinder to it. This dur the duration of this condition is tied to the duration of the blind condition. If a creature were to lose the blind condition, 
the severity of the hindered condition would caused by this feature would fade as well. I'm noticing a pattern with a lot with a lot of these condition stackings. Yeah. But this this one right here, crippling blindness. Um, hinder too because they're being blinded just reminds me of the goggles. They do nothing. <laughs> So, at 18th level, you gain one of two. You gain one of two. Either chosen of the flame, being afflicted fire grants you temporary hit points rather than dealing you damage. When you gain temporary hit points from being afflicted fire, you lose one severity of the condition. Whenever a feature or spell of yours deals fire damage, you may inf you may afflict fire to yourself. Whenever a creature hits you with a melee attack while you are afflicted fire, it is also afflicted fire one. <laughs> mm. It's a what? fucking bright wizard. Um, it reminds me more of something else, monk. What? Welcome back, Ashen One. <laughs> your entire, your entire, uh. Your entire um, journey to link the fire is, you, is essentially you setting yourself on fucking fire. Technically true, but I'm I'm going with a Warhammer. I'm going with a Warhammer Fantasy Bright Wizard, especially since in Vermintide, if you overcharge your fire magic, you will um, explode. Yes, you'll do the thing. Oh, on um, the other the other option you have is Shadow Form. You gain damage reduction equal to the severity of the hidden condition on you. Jesus. While you are hidden by darkness, you may move through other creatures and objects. Creatures and objects are hindering three for you. You take 20 piercing damage if you end your turn inside a creature or object. This damage cannot be prevented in any way. So, for Light and Shadow, you're either a Bright Wizard or you're... A sh or you're a shadow you're a shadow mancer with a bit of nightcrawler. Yeah. Um, let's see. Nature, you're different than a druid. I have I have a uh, I, I have a sudden <clears throat> I have a sudden feeling that um, there are going to be many cries of "I'm not a druid" for people who play this one. Uh, so first, you have domain of nature. You learn two of the following spells: earth, lightning, ice, or wind slash thunder. They do not count against the number of spells you may know. You gain proficiency in the nature skill. You also gain natural attunement. When you cast a spell granted to you from the Domain of Nature feature, you may choose from among any of the secondary options which would be available to, to you from the other spell granted by that feature. So, in other words, if I cast Earth, and the other, the other spell that I have is Lightning from this, I could add Lightning secondary options to Earth. Yep. You are... Um, at second level, you are a magical switch hitter with those two, with those two spells. Magical switch hitter who likes to fuck with people's brains. Mm -hmm. You also gain the you also gain the the domain of nature invocation invocation tempestuous nature. You may cast a spell granted to you by your domain of nature feature without spending spell points. You may select an additional secondary option. <coughs> <coughs> For this spell, in addition to the maximum amount of secondary options you would normally be able to channel into the spell. If the spell requires you to make a spell attack, you make the attack with advantage. If the spell attack misses, you need not expend a willpower for the invocation. Nice. At third level, you choose between either Stormborn or Natural Rejuvenation. Stormborn... When, you, when a creature hits you with a melee attack, it takes lightning or bludgeoning damage, your choice, 
equal to your resolve modifier, and you may use your reaction to make an attack of opportunity against it if it is within your reach. And in melee, it almost certainly is. Mm -hmm. Unless they're using a reach weapon themselves. And you do not possess one. Even, even Solution? Even. Just wield a spear. Yeah. Um, a, ves a vessel, a ves a nature vessel is probably is probably going to have a whole lot of poking. Which also means that we don't end up going through the cliche of of sword of um, shield and mace that that th that clerics are saddled with so often. Yes, that's very true. So the other one that you can get at third level is natural rejuvenation. Whenever you push forward, you automatically regain hit points depending on your level. At f at first tier, 10, and then 5 more for each tier afterwards. So at 20th level, you can get 30 hit points. As we have previously established, when we looked at the hit point pools granted by the Ancestries... Um, Hit points at high levels are not huge. It's, it's I didn't think we saw a single triple digit. Um, so thirty HP is rather significant. Mm -hmm. So at seventh level, you get you choose between either a warding elements, choose one of the following damage types: fire, acid, poison, cold, or lightning. You gain resistance to that damage type. Um, if you already have resistance, would you get immunity? Yeah, and we're going to need that clarification. And you get two deflection against ranged attacks. The other option is Eye of the Storm. When an attack you make against a creature within your melee reach does lightning or thunder damage, you may either push the creature 15 feet away from you or knock the creature prone if the attack would also hit its strength defense. At the beginning of your turn, creatures of your choice within 5 feet of you are afflicted lightning 1. You may only afflict a creature with severity equal to your resolve modifier in this way. So, Very not very not very nice setup. You're asen you're essentially a you're essentially a um essentially an overcharge of static electricity. Yep. Um, at fourteenth level you gain commune with nature. You may perform the speak with plants ritual without expending resources. You gain the speak with animals feat, and naturally occurring terrain such as brambles, roots, or rocks do not hinder you. Hooray! At 18th level, you gain either A, Master of Nature. When you cast a spell from your Domain of Nature feature, you may choose an additional secondary option without spending spell points. You may not use this feature to exceed your secondary effect limit. When you use your Invocation, you may choose one additional secondary option. That secondary option does not count against your secondary effect limit. Or Living Tempest. Your movement increases by 10 feet, Whenever you deal thunder or lightning damage, you gain a flying speed equal to your movement speed until the end of your next turn, and attacks of opportunity made against you are made with disadvantage. So, <laughs> the the nature, I'd say I'd say for I'd say for those who are who. Want to be more of the casty and more, want to be more of the overt um, casting the elements thing with with um, with their with their spell use. More likely or get more likely would pick a nature vessel than a druid, especially for all the storm stuff. Like it pretty much describes every mantis chugenja ever. <laughs> yep. I am the storm. So, the last the last subtype we have is War and Peace. Not to be confused with the book. God help you if you had to read that book. <laughs> uh, 
You had to read it, didn't you? <laughs> and Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> Did you have to read Statute Regulating, too? Luckily, no. Consider yourself fortunate. That's why I said luckily. <laughs> oh, God. Um, your bonus spell is either Weird or Enthrall. It does not count against the number of spells you know. If you already know both spells, you may instead learn a spell of your choice. Your invocation options are either Saving Grace, as an option you may give allies within 30 feet of you resistance to all damage types until the end of your next turn. <laughs> At second level, you, you spend a willpower, but still. Or Guided Strike. As an action, you may cause allies within 30 feet of you to automatically hit with attacks they make which target a physical defense until the, the beginning of your next turn. They may still roll the die to see if the hit would be critical or spell surge, but are considered to hit the target regardless of the modifiers or the roll of the die. Which means it automatically ignores the auto miss as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. Although... Um, Imagine using that with the with the group of monks we talked about a few a few weeks back that, uh -huh. that are all all using crossbows. <laughs> the the drunken crossbow monks, yes, yes. I remember. Wearing plate mail. Mm -hmm. Drunken crossbow disciples wearing plate mail. Essentially the Knights Templar when they're shacked up in a castle. Yeah, or the or the Van Zant militia. <laughs> uh they may, they, they may not be able to march together. They may not be able to make formations together, but they can damn sure shoot together. Mm-hmm. Oh, at third level, you either gain peace of mind. Please don't suicide, maiden. Or we and gain the gain proficiency in investigation and persuasions, proficiency in wits defense. If you already have that, you can choose another defense and increase your resolve by two. Your resolve score specifically. Your resolve, yeah, your resolve score. My bad, which is which is very potent given how all roads lead to resolve with this class. Yep. Or war forged. Not the, to be confused with the people. Mm -hmm. You gain proficiency in your constitution defense. If you already have proficiency in that, you choose another defense. You gain simple proficiency with all weapons. If you have simple proficiency with a weapon type from another feature or trait like your starting proficiencies, you gain martial proficiency with that weapon type instead. I would want the clarification of this includes uh, the, the class proficiencies, because I'm not sure if the class proficiencies count as a feature or trait that would, would fall under it. I think they would, but I, 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 that needs to be clarified. Um, I have to wonder if th this whole this whole thi this stacking rule when it comes to simple to martial, does, if that counts for... If that um, if that can if that double stacks, because if I recall from our from our brief look at equipment, there's three tiers for each for each weapon type. I don't remember. I'll have to look again. So, well, we'll probably we'll probably end up we'll, we'll probably end up cycling back to this once we once we tackle equipment. Yeah. Um, you also gain proficiency with tower shields and heavy armor. At seventh level, you can choose either harbinger of peace. Where, which grants a increase to your intuition and, and resolve defenses by one, and you gain a spellcasting feat, or battle ready, your strength and constitution defenses increase by one, and you gain a martial feat of your choice. At 14th level, you gain battle preparation. Choose one of the following damage types, bludgeoning, piercing, slashing. You gain resistance to the chosen damage type as long as it originates from a weapon attack, you may change your choice after a rest. So you're Batman. <laughs> you, had, you had prep time. At 18th level, you gain Avatar of Tranquility. Creatures of your choice within 30 feet of you, not including yourself, gain damage reduction equal to your resolve modifier. Which at 18th level, that's I wouldn't be surprised if that's if that's clo if that's around the 4. Yep. Oh. And you gain Avatar of Battle. 
creatures or you uh, gain. Yeah. You choose one. Doesn't say that. Oh, you're right. Well, um, I, I, I think that, that I I think that's a uh, I think that's I think that's a um an oversight because uh, all previous archetypes, every level except for the levels that have single, um, single uh, single uh, every levels except for second and third, second because it's where you get your domain and your attunement, mm -hmm. and third where you get your invocation. Um, and then 14th level, which usually has just a single feature. Every level that had two features always said choose one after the features. This doesn't say that. I think that might be an oversight um, on the 18th level feature because all other 18th level features. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest choose one be added in somewhere there. It's just my suggestion. Because I think that's just an oversight. I'm pretty sure you're only supposed to choose Tranquility or Battle. Not both. Mm -hmm. Oh, But Avatar of Battle. Creatures of your choice within 30 feet of you, not including yourself, deal additional damage with weapon attacks equal to your resolve modifier. Increase all your defenses by 2. You may, you may grant sh share... I think that's a typo. The benefits of this feature with at with allies while they remain within thirty feet of you. I think it's supposed to be share. You keep it. You don't give it to them, and they just go off with it. You 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 keep it, and they get it while they're near you. So, okay, this is gonna be a hor this is gonna be horrible on my part. But um, here's the here's the way I look at here's the way I look at the um, the vessel archetypes. Um, order it order and order and chaos. Is is a, is a is a wild mage? Okay. Either either a wild mage or an anti wild mage. Mm hmm. Um. Life and life and death is is basic is basically your classical cleric or necromancer. Or or if you prefer a white mage and a necromancer. Um, light and light and shadow is could be could be could be um could be a, could be the vessels of a sun god or a moon god. So, and I am having it canon that um the that a vessel of, a <clears throat> vessel of light in this case is solaire. So, um, something I was I was gonna say that you're gonna really really hate me for. Try me. A vessel of light. I cast magic missile at the darkness. You're right. I do hate you. <laughs> um, never, never seek permission when you can seek forgiveness. I don't even seek that. The, I'd, I'd say the, I'd, I'd say when it comes to the analog of of the na of the nature one, um, whatever, whatever. Whoever ends up picking a nature vessel is probably is probably going to have to say for the last fucking time I'm not a druid. Yup. Not a druid. Instead, you're either storm, literally. Or the foggy swamp benders. I mean I was gonna say swamp thing, but okay. Yeah, I can go I can go with it. I can go with either, or the, gr and w War and Peace. Um, you're either a Jedi Guardian or a Jedi Counselor. Why are you going with boring Jedi though? Can't we just say that with War and Peace you're Jane Austen? <laughs> as tempting as that would be, no, that's. I think that's a little bit too highbrow. Monk, we have to appeal to the smarter... Oh, wait, there's nobody smarter in our audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm calling out every one of you! Get some culture, you bastards! Given how, given how, some, of, given how some of them... Um, given how cer certain people who will not be named ten, tend, to, tend to stick to only a handful of genres or a handful of styles or 
in some or in some cases assume that assume that every fantasy is every fantasy game is of is of a certain style of fantasy that I've ranted on for years. Um, yeah, get some fucking culture. I can taste it. I can taste it, monk. The 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 tears. Mmm, tasty stuff. Look, we're just, look, we're just prepping for the we're just prepping for the moments in, in two in two days when we end up ro when we end up roasting ev when we end up roasting every main for FF14. Have yourself a merry little death miss. <laughs> but but ser but seriously, that's that's what I see. The the counselor is very is very much the pe is very much the peace archetype, and the guardian is very much the war archetype. Um, although although um, give although given what we've co given what we've covered in the past, I think we need to load up the paladin, so we can so we can have a better understanding on how it affects <laughs> the vessel. Yes, my favorite thing to do: paladin, boon, and blessing. Uh. Comparisons. So, so, also, um, as as a bit of an aside, Tanner, when it comes to the blessing effect table, could you put these in alphabetical order because the vessel is way too high up? Ends up throwing me off. Ends up throwing him off. Doesn't really throw me off, but you know, I'm, a, I'm just I'm a, stick, I'm, a stick, I'm a stickler for organization. You know this. Yep. So. With the vessel, we got you may use your will your ally may use your willpower rather than their own to utilize their invocation feature. What? What the fuck? <laughs> hey um Hey Paladin, bless me. Why? I need your willpower. What? <laughs> of course, if they do so it recovers according to the invocation feature, so which means you get it back at at your rest. Mm -hmm. Instead, and of then of course, course, and then of course, if you're a paragon who gets a boon, you gain an additional willpower for blessing them. A paladin, mm -hmm. bless me. Yeah, why? I need your willpower so I can so I can invoke my god. Okay, I mean I get a free willpower for doing this, so go ahead. <laughs> What I think, one thing, one thing that I've slowly come to realize is that is that I'd say I'd say ever since the second class overview that we did with Heavens and Heresies, it wasn't long before we started coming up with um part with party combinations. In yes. a weird way, it kind of reminds me of of the of one of the more enduring um class com um enduring two man dynamics in Team Fortress Two. That being a heavy medic duo. Yep. Save your Uber. Mm -hmm. But uh, my uh, I mean, if I was gonna make a class with with these two and two mi two more for a four man band, I'm gonna go Harold with them because Harold, and I'm gonna go uh, Inquisitor with them. Harold, Inquisitor, Paladin, uh, Vessel. For what is possibly the most stomp your face in bullshit ever. <laughs> oh, Harold, you need you need to go and 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 hit somebody with more of of the. Uh, you're, you're a Harold of beauty. You want to inflict people with all that tasty, tasty bullshit? Okay, here's your blessing and my boon, because I'm a paragon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this is oh my god just, just just think about what you could do just think about what you could do oh yeah there's a there's a whole ho there's a whole host of pure unadulterated bullshit that you can do and um <laughs> next week next week we will be ta we will be tackling the wizard um uh, Daffy Duck will not be making an appearance, unfortunately. Nor Rincewind. No, he's too busy running away. Which is what he's best at. 
Yeah, but but remember, even then, even if he does run away, he may end up in a barrel that, through some series of events, gets to the gets to the end of the journey and ends up fulfilling the prophecy anyway. And yes, I paraphrased even... it. <laughs> well, that that is true. That is true. But he's probably running away because someone's trying to kill him. Although no surprise. If, uh, although, if he, although if he ever says that someone was trying to kill him, all all that anyone can say is, "Do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down?" That's why I said no surprise. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the the wizard is going to be an interesting one because because of something that I. I've hint I hinted at at first when we did the reconstructing five e, uh, not reconstructing five reconstructing D and D classes. I yeah. hinted at it again when we talked about the wizard in level up five e, uh -huh. the, the play test anyway, and I hinted at it again last night when we did the ranking thing. And that is, for the longest time, the wizard shtick was the spellcaster, full stop. So you had you had the sub you had subtypes of the of them specializing in one of these spheres, but for the most part, spellcasting was their shtick since day one. But when other spellcasting when other types of spellcasters started to make an appearance and started to become actually viable instead of just weak sauce versions of the of the wizard, um, look looking at looking at you 3.0 sorcerer. Not the 3.5 sorcerer, which is better, but the 3.0 sorcerer, which was shit. Yep. That's when, that's when you started to get. The wizard started to lose its lose its particular foothold because, much like the fighter, having the argument of you get more spells is not exactly going to going to stick when everybody else gets spells and other things. They get spells and cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Or in the case of the cleric, bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> and of of course the 5th edition wizard gets this the worst because of because having mostly f having so much of a spell focus means they have to deal with the bullshit that is concentration. And now on paper, on paper, there seems to be a sh there seems to be a shift towards the wizard being the studious spellcaster, but in practice, it does it has not manifested. And I even talked about that even the fourth edition wizard has that problem because the implement stuff that that they do, you'd think you think that being able to use a implement, which is basically a magic item, more gooder, is something that an artificer would do. Indeed. The now when it com now that's that's why that's why the take on the wizard is going to be interesting. There, from the previews that we that we saw in the past, there is the implication that the wizard is get, is going to be the master of spell scrolls. But w but um, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it next week, and after that, we will be completely done with the. Classes, which means we can move into, um, art, which means we can move into artistry, spells, and equipment, which will not be as long as it, of a chapter as ancestries and classes were. So, uh, I, I have to make this, uh, I have to make this reference because the classes has been the longest. It's been a week per, with some breaks in between weeks because of personal issues and monk moving. Just keep in mind, guys, Black Friday. It's the final countdown to Black Friday. I didn't sing it, Monk, but you still knew what I meant. Yeah. <clears throat> I knew I knew exact I knew exactly what you meant, which is why I'm giving which is why I'm giving it a pass. <laughs> but we will but that's something that we'll cover next week. This Sunday, the return of Geek Watch and the finale in the Exodus trilogy, and that's gonna, that's going to be fun because we'll have some new we'll have some new faces to show up and get and get broken into how we do things. I'm so excited. Both of them are co are close personal friends of mine. I'm really so excited. <laughs> 
So we'll we'll see how, we'll see how well they're able to survive. Oh, my buddy Zero will definitely survive. Yeah, I, f I feel like I feel like I'm I feel like I'm invoking the the me that meme from Halo Reach. Current objective: survive. Spoilers: <laughs> You don't survive. I mean, you can if you're good enough. You can survive forever in that map. But with but with that said, once again, a sincere thanks to everyone who is who's been taking the time to listen to to listen to us blather on on these, and we will be continue continuing to do so because um once we once we wrap up with heavens and heresies, it's not going to be a case where I where I end up putting um putting value of the judge on the on the shelf for six months or something like that because this is too much doing this is too much fun. Um, Indeed, it's almost like it's almost like I'm doing an evolution of the Let's Study um, series that Jay Anyong does. <laughs> Which shout out to shout out to the life and times of a Philippine gamer. He's one of the reasons I even started doing this shit. Um, but until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay. Fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>